today we are going to talk about limit of function of two variables. I thought I'm witty. So let me start by reviewing the definition of limits for functions of one variable. So we say that the limit of a function f of x as x approaches a is equal to l if we can make the values of the function as close to l as we like by restricting x to be sufficiently close to a but not equal to a. So roughly speaking what that means is that as x approaches a the value of the function approaches l. Now we can make this st statement precise mathematically. So the precise statement would, would be that the limit of f of x as x approaches a is equal to l if for all numbers epsilon greater than zero, there is a number delta greater than zero such that if the distance between x and a is between zero and delta, then the distance between f of x and l is less than epsilon. Now here you can pick any epsilon. So what that means is that you can make the values of the function as close as you want to l by restricting x to be sufficiently close to a but not equal to a. So that's the precise definition of what a limit means. Now the definition of limits for functions of two variables is pretty much the same. So we say that the limit of a function f of xy as xy approaches a b is equal to l if we can make the values of the function as close to l as we like by taking the point xy sufficiently close to a b but not equal to a b. So again, roughly speaking, what that means is that x, as xy approaches the point a b, the value of the function approaches l. And just as before, we can make this statement precise mathematically. The definition is just uh, very similar to the previous one. So let f be a function of two variables whose domain includes point arbitrarily close to a, b. So you have a neighborhood of a, b inside your domain. Then we say that the limit of f of x, y as x, y approaches a, b is equal to l if for all numbers epsilon greater than zero, there is a number delta greater than zero such that if xy is in the domain and the distance between the point xy and the point ab is between zero and delta, then the distance between the value of the function and l is less than epsilon. And again, we can pick any epsilon here. So what that means is that we can make the value of the function as close to l as we'd like by taking the point xy in our domain to be sufficiently close to ab but not equal to ab. Now one could ask when do such limits actually exist? Now if we go back to the one-dimensional case, we know that the limit will exist if the left-sided limit exists and the right-sided limit exists and they both are equal. Now one way to think about this is that we're working in one dimension, so working on the x-axis and we're approaching a point A and there's really two different ways of approaching it. You can approach from the left or you can approach from the right and you have to make sure that if you approach from the left or the right, then the value of the function approaches the same value l. But now in two dimensions, this is more complicated because now we're working in the plane x, y, and we're approaching a point here, a, b. But there are now many different ways that we can approach the point a, b. We could approach along a path like this. We could approach along a line here or any different path that goes through this point. So we have to make sure that the limit is the same regardless of the path that we take to approach the point a, b. This leads us to the following statement. For the limit to exist, the function f of x, y must approach the same limit for all paths of approach. And in particular, if it approaches, say, l1 along a certain path, but it approaches l2 along a different path and l1 is not equal to l2, then we say that the limit does not exist. So let me give you an example of a limit that does not exist. So suppose that you consider the limit as x, y approaches the origin, 0, 0, of the function x squared minus y squared over x squared plus y squared. All right, so now we're working in the plane x, y, and we're approaching the origin. So there's, of course, many different ways you can approach the origin. So let's consider two particular ways. I'm first going to consider approaching the origin on the x-axis. Right? So this would be my first case. So then I'm, I'm setting y equals to 0 here. Then the value of the function at y equals to 0 is just x squared over x squared, which is equal to 1 for x not equals to 0. Remember, we're not evaluating at the origin, which we're taking a limit. 
So from there, you conclude that the function f of xy approaches the value 1 as xy approaches the origin along the x-axis, right? Because if I set y equals to 0, so I'm on the x-axis, then the function becomes just 1, so the limit is actually equal to 1. All right, but if I approach on the y-axis, then you see that I get something different. So if I approach on the y-axis, that means I'm setting x equals to 0. So now the function evaluated at 0 and y is equal to minus y square over y square, which is equal to 1 for, again, y not equals to 0. I'm taking a limit, not evaluating at the origin. So from this, I conclude that the function f of xy approaches the value minus 1 as xy approaches the origin along the y-axis. But clearly, these are different. 1 and minus 1 are not the same, so that means that here the value of the limit depends on the path of approach, so we say that the limit does not exist. So how do we actually evaluate limits of functions of two variables? This is not so easy, because what you have to do is check that the value of the limit is the same for all paths going through the point you're interested in. So that's not so easy. But fortunately, there's a lot of tools you can use. So one thing that you can use is the limit laws. So all the limit laws that you saw for limits of a function of one variable are also uh, true here. So the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. The limit of a product is the product of the limits, and so on. You also have things like the limit of simple functions like x as xy approaches ab is equal to a, the limit of y as xy approaches ab is equal to b, and of course the limit of a constant, which is what we used in the previous example, so any constant is equal to the constant itself. So basically you can use all these properties together to evaluate the limit of more complicated functions. Another thing you can use is the squeeze theorem, which is something that you already studied for limits of functions of one variable, so it still holds gear. And one more thing you could use is just the definition of the limit, but we're not going to do that in this class. But you could use the epsilon delta definition to show that a limit exists. But even with all these tools, it's not so easy to evaluate the limit of functions of two variables. Fortunately, there's one class of functions for which it is very easy, and these are continuous functions. So recall that in the case of one variable, a function was continuous if you can sketch its graph without lifting your pen. So that means there's no hole, there's no jump, anything like that. Now it's the same idea here, but the sketch of the graph is now a surface. So the precise definition is that a function of two variables is continuous at a point AB if the limit of the function at this point exists and is equal to the value of the function at this point. And we also say that it's continuous on its domain if it is continuous at all points in the domain. Fortunately, most of the functions we will be interested in are continuous. So one class of continuous functions are polynomial functions of two variables. So these are polynomials in the variables x and y. And all polynomial functions are continuous over R2. So for any point a, b, the limit of a polynomial is equal to the evaluation of the polynomial at this point. Another class of functions that are continuous are rational functions, so these are ratio of polynomials. So these are continuous over their domain. So here you have to be careful because you have to remove the locus in R2 where the denominator vanishes. But once you've removed that, then the function is continuous on the domain. And the other class that we will be interested in uh, is by composing functions. So if you have a function f of xy, which is continuous, and you compose it with a function g of a single variable that is also continuous, then you will obtain a new function, h of xy, which will be continuous. So if f here is continuous and g is also continuous, then you can prove that the function h is also continuous. So an example here would be to take the exponential of a polynomial, which would be continuous over R2. So in this class, pretty much all the examples of functions of two variables we will be interested in will fall into one of these three classes.